In two weeks, as we gather to celebrate the great three days of Jesus' passion and death and resurrection, our Jewish siblings will be gathering to share the Seder, the Seder for Passover. While we walk with Jesus through Jerusalem, journeying with him from the garden to the governor's mansion, to the cross and the empty tomb, journeying from death into life, they will be walking with their ancestors from the night of terror, out through the blood-marked blood doorposts from Ramses to Succoth, pausing at the shore of the Red Sea, and finally passing through the waters from slavery into freedom. That's no coincidence, of course. The last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples was a Seder. On the night of his arrest, they retold that story of God delivering them from Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea. In fact, on Maundy Thursday, we will do the same thing, sharing that very story again, reminding us of God's deliverance from Egypt. That event, that exodus, is the event that defines what it means to be Jewish. And that Jewishness, even now, informs for us what it means to be Christian. What happened at the Red Sea is what makes a Jew a Jew as much as anything else. And that's what makes Isaiah's words to his Jewish audience so stunning. Thus says the Lord, the maker of a way in the sea and in the path in the mighty waters, the bringer out of horse and chariot, army and warrior, extinguished, quenched like a wick. Forget what I did. It's unimportant. Don't even think about it. Unimportant, he says. Forget it, he says. The defining event of Jewish history, not even worth calling to mind. Isaiah's point, of course, is that this former thing pales in comparison to the new thing that God is doing now. But he's also suggesting that if we're too busy looking back at what was, we could miss what's happening right under our noses. Now it springs forth, he says. Do you not perceive it? As Daryl mentioned, in Isaiah's context, that new thing is the return from exile in Babylon. The Israelites have been surviving as a people during this exile by hanging on to their Jewish identity. But now, Isaiah is calling them to let that identity go. God is going to give them a new identity through what happens next when God returns them to their home. And sure enough, that's exactly what God does. <clears throat> Christians love to read Isaiah because we see in Isaiah's oracles and promises the hints of what God is about to do in Jesus. But the book of Isaiah is written half a century before Jesus was born. Neither the prophet nor his disciples, who likely finished his book, ever imagined a Jewish rabbi who would be God's son dying on a cross. A Roman cross at that. We might just as well imagine Martin Luther predicting the space shuttle program or smartphones. And yet, despite this, we can clearly see God fulfilling these promises anew in Christ. And that's the beauty of this book, is that the authors are not writing about one-time actions, but about the ongoing work of God. These promises are perennially true, and that's why we keep reading them. And with that in mind, and thinking about the prophet's lack of regard for this defining moment in Jewish history, I wonder how we as Christians might read these words today. What might be the former thing that gives us our entire identity as a community that's not worth remembering? I was pondering that question, and I got to thinking, what if Isaiah is telling us to forget the passion? That's quite a thought, isn't it? The week before Palm Sunday. What if we all just went home right now and skipped the next two weeks? 
But what if we simply forgot about the thing that makes us who we are? But that's not really what Isaiah is asking us to do, is it? He's not urging us to amnesia, but to mindfulness. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? The real question Isaiah is asking here is, what are we missing God doing now while we're busy looking at what God did then? And that's a question I think has merit. Setting aside for just a moment the theologically correct answers that we learned in Sunday school and confirmation classes, what is it that Jesus does on the cross that God is still doing now? Thinking of ourselves as the church or as a nation, what's our current exile? What are we enslaved to these days that we need, being, that we need to be freed from? How is God delivering us from that? You see, when you get right down to it, God really only does one thing. God loves. God loves creation into being, loves life into existence, loves Israel through, uh, through the exodus and the promised land and the exile and the return. It's just that God's love is so incredibly powerful and creative that it keeps taking new shapes. The former things, then, things like the exodus or the return from exile or the passion, those things continue to give us meaning and hope because the new things God is doing are consistent with those. But maybe our identity doesn't come from any of those things. Maybe who we are is best understood, not in light of what God did once a long time ago, but of what God is always doing, what God is still doing, even now. We can still say that God is revealed most fully in the life of Jesus, but maybe, maybe God isn't limited to that. Maybe instead of being confined to flower beds and lawns, God's Love springs forth from cracks and sidewalks and broken pots. Maybe it grows over bricks and unattended shingles. Maybe it even shows through the paint in those damp bathroom corners. The question is whether we will perceive it or is our sight focused on something else. Paul told the Philippians, that he'd come to see all those things that, he used to, that used to identify him, that he used to consider his credentials, he sees those now as rubbish. And rubbish is a polite English word for the Greek word that Paul uses that refers to the stuff that you flush down the toilet. He was disgusted by his pedigree and his training and his assets. Why is that? Because they kept him from seeing God. All those things that used to count as gain, he says, they're a loss. They put me at a loss. They hold me back because they kept him from seeing God. Instead, he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. Paul's entire life had been filled with things like obedience to the law and dedication to his faith tradition, but the real fullness he now saw was that all surpassing value was in living as Christ lived and dying as Christ died, in emptiness. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, he writes a chapter earlier who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. When Paul was on the road to Damascus, blind and helpless, none of those things that defined him could help him. 
his zeal, his blamelessness, his righteousness, his identity as an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin, none of that could help him. At his weakest and most vulnerable, when he was utterly empty, that's where Christ found him. That's how he learned to let go of those things, to let go of himself. And that's where Saul died. And it's also where Paul was born. At his emptiest was where he found himself filled. It wasn't until all the stones on which he'd founded his life had been pulled up and removed that he saw God's new things sprouting all over. What I like about that plant metaphor is that plants grow from seeds. And seeds have this hard outer shell that protects the plant embryo until it sprouts. It keeps it from drying out or getting crushed. It can even pass through a digestive system and still be alive. That seed coat is necessary and important. But it's just as necessary and important for the plant to split and shed that seed coat if it's going to survive. All of those things about Paul that were important to him, those things made him who, they, who he was. They were necessary and important. But when they fell away, he was able to grow beyond them into who God was still creating him to be. I hear Paul and Isaiah encouraging us to consider for ourselves what those seed coats, those things that protect us and give us shape and form and definition, what those things might be. And to imagine what God might bring forth from us when those things fall away. What Paul experienced when he, was, when he let go, that something was so incredible that it kept him rejoicing, even in prison. The more he gave, the more he served, the more he loved, the more Christ himself was there the more he knew Christ and saw himself in Christ. He was like Mary in that dining room. The love he felt simply couldn't be expressed, couldn't be shown. For Mary, 300 denarii bottles of perfume and her dignity and her reputation, all of those things were rubbish compared to the something that filled her from the inside, that new thing that she suddenly perceived. So why does Mary see it and Judas doesn't? What is it that keeps us, keeps the world around us from knowing that something that God has blooming everywhere? What is it that blocks our perception of the new thing that God has always been bringing into being? That's the question with which we're called to wrestle in Lent. Paul joins with Isaiah and Mary, and Moses, and even Jesus, in inviting us to pass through the waters, to wash away the rubbish clogging our eyes, to say goodbye to those seed coats that have protected us and given us meaning for so long, so that God's new thing can spring forth. Israel was conquered by Babylon, taken away. They died in exile. And then that most tragic event in Jewish history became the birth canal for what is now modern Judaism. Maybe even that death we fear most will in the end bring another opportunity for God to fill us up. <laughs>